guys. Sleep. I'm talking about sleep. I got lots to talk about. I got lots to talk about with sleep and I'm going to pin that comment. I'm going to go live on Facebook right now. It's supposed to do it by itself, but it didn't. Oh my goodness. Go live now. Facebook keeps changing the live interface. <laughs> it's so cute of them. I love that for them. <sighs> yes, every time I log in to do a live, it's different, but that's okay. My technology problems are not your problems. I'm here to talk about sleep. I'm going to get my community up and run in here on Facebook. And like I said, I would. Oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me with this. Sleep. Go live. All right. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. All right, welcome. Welcome Facebook, welcome Instagram. I'm only doing this on Instagram because I thought I might want to save this to my IGTV. I'm hoping it won't be too long, but I'll tell you guys something. I was putting together some notes for this session on sleep and my notes are huge. I have so many things to talk about. Um, but I want to start by just sharing why I'm talking about this. Truly, this um, the spirit behind this is because I feel like all of my clients right now are struggling with their sleep and more than ever, more than ever, more than really ever. And maybe that's because as I age, my clients are aging and we're all kind of in that perimenopause state of mind. Then it, you also have to take into account, like it's a weird time we've been living through. So there's something to that as well. Um, but what I'm hearing consistently from my clients is like, man, I just can't sleep. And what I think is beautiful about that, one thing that I think is great about that is that there's an inner knowing that sleep is really important. Um, so that's happening. That's great. I love that you guys know that. Um, and there's, there's an opportunity here to make things better. So I want to share with you what I know. Okay. So in this workshop, I'm going to cover the fundamental sleep hygiene rules, the stuff that you probably already know. Quick, quick dive into that. Um, but they're also worth reviewing. I'll also share some next level circadian and rhythm and sleep tactics that I swear by and that we're not really hearing as much about. Um, we're gonna talk about why sleep is important, real quick, shallow dive. I'm gonna talk about um, supplements a little bit. You know, I don't play in supplements very much myself, but it's a question I get asked a lot and I have a few ideas. I'm going to talk about light sleepers. Anybody out there, give me a comment if you identify as being a light sleeper. Oh, I'm a light sleeper. Give me a comment or give me an emoji. Give me this. Give me the snoozing emoji. <laughs> a light sleeper. I'm going to talk about that specifically. Uh, I'm going to talk about waking up at 3 a.m. I'm going to have a little bit of a conversation about that. Um, I want to talk about a little mindfulness a practice that I give to my clients when they do wake up in the middle of the night and have a hard time getting back to sleep. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about something kind of wacky and kooky that I learned about waking up at 3 a.m. just as a fun little adjacent topic. And I'm going to tell you what to do when you wake up at 3 a.m. and then your brain starts going crazy and you can't get back to sleep. Um, and then I have just, you guys, just a light touch on what seems to be happening during perimenopause, a little bit of a... Um, findings of some research I did. So that's a very small bit. So if you're not a perimenopausal woman, don't worry. This whole session is not about that. But if you are a perimenopausal woman, there's a couple things that I uncovered that are pretty compelling. Uh, one thing that was really cool, literally just before I got on this call, I was scrolling through my email and I got an email from Netflix. You know how they're always so so nice to tell you what's coming to Netflix. And I don't know if you guys saw this email too, but at least Netflix Canada, we're... Uh, coming this week is the Headspace app. So the Headspace app, which you might have on your phone, a meditation app, they had a little meditation program on Netflix. I still haven't watched that either because in my mind, that's there's like cognitive dissonance. They're like, I'm going to watch TV to learn how to meditate. That doesn't... Anyway, they're, they're releasing a sleep program this week, like a, a program about sleep, which also cognitive dissonance because you're looking at your TV to learn how to sleep. It's just kind of kooky. But I thought that's pretty cool that that came up in my inbox today right as I was getting set to do this talk. So what, what that tells me is that I'm hearing it from you guys. I'm hearing it from freaking Netflix. We understand that sleep is important. So why is sleep important? Here's why. Sleep, and this is going to be a review for most of you guys. I just want to say hi to Facebook. Hi, Facebook, because I don't know for sure if, if you're seeing me or if you can hear me. 
Give me a give me a, an emoji if you can if you can. Sometimes what happens is when I um, am on these lives, uh, I can't see the comments. It's very irritating. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to troubleshoot that right now before I get into my um, my spiel here. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you why sleep is important, and you probably already know why sleep is important, but I'm just going to review it for you because I think it's important to review it. Okay. Oh, we got some people giving me emojis. Thanks, gang. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Facebook. Okay. Sleep is non-negotiably essential for basic physiological operations, period. Okay. Your immune system is most active during sleep. That's important, right? Quality sleep is essential for neurological function, cognitive performance, memory, mental acuity. Uh, it's, when, it's when your body and brain are repairing. We know that. All right. Good job, Facebook. Yay, it's working. Thank goodness. I just don't think I had it in me to deal with another technical glitch. Sleep impacts our metabolism too. This is the space I play in predominantly. So one night of poor sleep or short sleep has been shown to make the body's cells slightly more resistant to the hormone insulin, which makes it harder to fuel your cells for energy and a little easier to store fuel as fat. We don't really want to have our cells being resistant to insulin and one poor night's sleep, a little uptick in that insulin resistance. Um, when we lack sufficient deep sleep, this is restorative deep sleep. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. We can see changes in the hormone leptin. Do you guys know what leptin is? Leptin is a hormone that it's a chemical in our body that signals to us that we've had enough food. It's basically the satiety hormone. Um, so leptin resistance is associated with increased appetite and therefore weight gain. I don't want to make your eyes glaze over with this biochemistry. These are just quick hits, just important things to know from a metabolic perspective, because most people who are following me are following me for the metabolic, you know, info, right? Now, but we talk about like behavior change. This is probably even more troubling is from the perspective of behavior change, chronic tiredness lowers our inhibitions. It's hard to want to take good care of yourself when you're feeling kind of dragged out. And that's what we can tend to dive into the sweets and treats because we're not feeling well and we want to comfort ourselves, right? You know what that feels like. So you guys know this. We all know this. Sleep is important. And that's why we're here. Am I right? I'm right. So in this session, I'm offering up some tactical sleep tips. I'm offering discussion around sleep. I'd love for you to weigh in with your personal sleep problems. Ask questions as I go along. And let's just get going. I want to start with the classic sleep hygiene tip. So when we say sleep hygiene, we're talking about the things that you do to set your body and your environment up to have the best possible chance to enable good sleep. You probably know some of these already. Maybe not though, maybe not. So let me help you out here. Here's the classic sleep hygiene tips. Avoid caffeine in the afternoon. So where's my coffee drinkers at? Any coffee drinkers out there? Yeah, you drink it in the morning and then like nip that in the bud at 12 noon. By the way, that phrase is nip it in the bud. Bud, not butt. Okay, if you take anything away from this workshop, I hope it's that. Nip it in the bud. <laughs> I got a heart on Instagram. Beautiful. Okay, so you know that. Try Minimize your caffeine in the afternoon. Um, people metabolize caffeine at different rates. Let's just hedge our bets and stop that at noon. That makes sense. Minimize your exposure to blue light at or around sunset time, right? You guys probably knew that too. Okay, our phones do this for us now. Like the technology is catching up. Um, our phones kind of put this amber hue. If you have it set up on your phone, that night shift setting where it goes a little more amber at nighttime because the blue that is emitted from the, our screens kind of mimics midday sunlight. So in the middle of the day, it's very blue out there, very blue spectrum of light. That signals to the body that it's the middle of the day. We don't want that signal when it's at the end of the day. We, we are nature and we run on a circadian clock and we are attuned to the rising and the setting of the sun and we want to get into rhythm with that, which I'm going to talk about in this session. Don't you worry. So, but blue light exposure, when we're expecting a different spectrum of light, amber in the afternoons, in the evenings, it, it, our brains really don't know what to do with it. It throws our whole rhythm into a loop. Uh, into a loop. You lost me? Oh, I think I'm still here. I think I'm still here. I'm going to keep talking because I think I'm still here. I'm not getting any indication that my internet's gone down. 
damn it, Elon, work with me. So minimizing blue exposure to blue light after sunset. So this could be the night shift setting on your gadgets. It could be blue light blocking glasses. Those are great. Okay. Maybe you've heard this one. Sleep in a cool, dark, quiet room. Those three things always come together. So cool because your body temperature naturally cools down as we're sleeping, especially when we get into deep sleep. The body naturally cools down into deep sleep and then it warms up when it's time to wake up. If we're fighting that in a really warm room, lost on Facebook. Oh, classic Facebook. Well, it says it's still going, so I'm going to keep talking on Facebook. And I can still see me on Facebook. Um, so cool, cool room. Okay, a lot of us have heated blankets and we have a hot room and it feels cozy to get into a warm bed, but our body's expecting cool. Oh yeah, my live broadcast has been interrupted. Hmm. On Facebook. Okay, Facebook, stay with me. I'm coming back. I'm still on Instagram. It ended. Great. Great. One second. I love technology. It's the best. It's just the best. Facebook Live was frozen. Okay. We're going live again, people. We can do this. A lot stupider people than me have successfully run a freaking Facebook Live. Am I right? Yes. Sleep. Oh my gosh, Facebook, <laughs> work with me, man. Okay, use camera. Sleep take two. This is good quality content. Tech glitch. Go live. Facebook, we're back. Sorry, buddies. We're back, Facebook. We're back Instagram. You're so patient, Instagram. All right. So I'm talking about classic sleep hygiene tips. I'm on tip number two. Sleep in a cool, dark, quiet room. So cool because our body temperature is meant to be cool as we sleep. Dark because, just like I touched on a second ago, the, the body is perceiving light. We are attuned to light. And if any little bits of light are creeping in to our light receptors in our eyes or on our body, it's going to prevent us from really entering into deep sleep because the body doesn't really know what time it is. And the quiet room, well, that just goes without saying. You gotta sleep in a quiet room um, because we wanna prevent disruption of sleep as much as possible, right? And the other, the final sort of classic sleep hygiene tip is having a consistent sleep and wake schedule. So really try your best to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, even on weekends, right? Of course, there's some wiggle room there. I know there's lots of folks who work shift work and or inconsistent shifts and that is um a real big struggle that is hard to solve for in a facebook live if you're here facebook say hi um so avoid caffeine in the afternoon minimize exposure to blue light after sunset sleep in a cool dark quiet room and have a consistent sleep week wake schedule that's the classic sleep hygiene tips if you did that you'd be crushing it, okay? Now, I have some next level sleep tactics that I wanna to talk to you about. I'm a person who wears the melatonin molecule around her neck. So this is important stuff to me. For me, this all comes down to what I was talking about a second ago, which is this rising and setting of the sun. And we want to set our body up to tune, be in tune with it, okay? so. This starts when you get up in the morning. When you get up in the morning, when you get up in the morning, as early as you possibly can, try to get outside and expose yourself to early daylight. Early daylight, okay? Because this is gonna tell your body like, hey, a day just, can't, uh, a day just happened. It's a day, a day happened. Time to wake up. So this, what this does is it turns on certain neurotransmitters and turns off other ones. Certain hormones drive up, certain hormones come down. So serotonin is sort of the wakefulness, alertful, alertness hormone. That one starts to rise when we get the sense of the sun setting. And melatonin, the sleep hormone, the one that I wear on, around my neck, it goes down. The other thing that happens when we expose ourselves to early daylight is another is a neurotransmitter called adenosine. I don't want to bore you with these words, but adenosine is a neurotransmitter that kind of starts to build. 
kind of starts to build. Uh, it starts to build when it senses the early daylight exposure and it counts up to our sleep clock. Okay, so adenosine, st we, start the, we start the clock on sleep by exposing to early daylight. Uh, I'm say saying this had gone on Facebook, but I'm still seeing it on Facebook. I started a new one on Facebook and I'm really apologetic because this is all supposed to happen on Facebook and then Facebook screwed me over, which it does sometimes. Okay, so early daylight exposure. Now, as early as you can, given the, con the confines of your schedule, right? As early as you can get outside, expose yourself to some daylight. This is going to help you start that sleep clock. It also turns on serotonin to wake you up and turns off melatonin. It's the perfect, it's the perfect formula to get you set up. So morning daylight exposure sets you up for the, that night's sleep. Now, not to get too fussy with this, but I also would love for you to get some midday sun exposure. So if you can, in the middle of the day, you go out when the sun is at its peak, where at that maximum blue light scenario, sun is high in the sky, that tells your body, hey, this is the middle of the day. We're just providing the body with light inputs that tell it where we're at in the day. Okay, so we're providing the, the body with inputs to tell, tell it where it's at in the day, because everything that we do, if I haven't made this very clear, is attuned to the rising and setting of the sun. So now we're going to tell the body that we're in the middle of the day. And that that tells the body like, okay, maybe serotonin can start to like crest and maybe we're going to start thinking about melatonin. Not yet. It's still too early, but we're going to start thinking about it. This may come as no surprise, but sunset exposure would then be the third <laughs> tactic here. I want you to go out when the sun is setting or when the sun has now come toward the western side of the horizon and we're starting to get that change in light quality away from blue more toward amber, this tells the body that, okay, it's evening time, we're going to be going to sleep soon. And so that's when melatonin starts to kind of think about lifting. Melatonin, your sleep hormone, okay, really important. So we've got early daylight exposure, midday light exposure, and sunset exposure. That's a lot of sun exposure. That means you have to get outside <laughs> three times a day. Why not? Why not? Oh, this is a good question. What about wake up sun clocks I've used for years? Those are pretty cool. Those are neat. So the wake up sun clocks, they, uh, instead of emitting noise, well, they do have, they have a little sort of a song, a songbird noise, but they actually have a, a light that glows brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and kind of mimics a sunrise. It's super cool. But I still would like you to get into the actual sun. To be honest with you, I just think getting out into the actual sun and getting out into the world and getting out into nature is a health uh, behavior that we just need to be doing more of, truly. So as far as I'm concerned, if we can kill a few birds with one stone here, get out into actual sunlight so we can have our light receptors, you know, clocking that. Um, we're also in nature, we're breathing fresh air, we're getting outside, maybe we're touching the ground with our bare feet. Super good, right? Where did I get the necklace anyway? I got it from a company called Made With Molecules. Made With Molecules. And she sells all kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters. This one had to get custom made because nobody wanted melatonin. But I wanted it. Okay. So now we've gone out to see the sunrise, we've gone out to see the midday sun, we've gone out to see the sunset. Now it's the evening time. So, you know, as touched on earlier, you're gonna probably wanna mellow out on the blue light exposure from your devices, maybe pop on your blue light blocking glasses. And in conjunction with that, I strongly encourage you to have a wind down routine. So for a lot of people, this is something like, I have a bath or I read my book or I have a cup of tea or, I meditate or I take a walk or whatever it might be. Something that is like signifying an energetic shift in the day. I am super guilty of working all day, every day. Guilty, guilty, right? Where's my hyperproductive people at? Give me some love if you're a highly productive human. But when, when the clock hits 8 p.m., for me, that's my wind down time. 7.30, 8 p.m., it's like, I'm done here. There's no more benefit to me crushing this work day. Sometimes I have to. I get greater benefit from winding down, changing my energy. And in doing that, in changing my energy and going for the walk or, or reading my book, I'm changing my exposure to light. My book, you know, I, have, I turn a lamp on, turn my computers off, lamps on. I'm changing the quality of light. I'm changing the energy and the pace of my day. There's a, there's a, a palpable shift in, in the energy of the day when you invite in a wind down. So I really encourage you, I, guys, I know you're busy, you got, you got stuff to do, but you've got to sleep. You ha I mean, you can't be you if you're not getting sleep, and it's more important than whatever project you're working on. I know sometimes you're going to have to crush an all-nighter, I get it. I'm talking on the regular. Be very intentional in your wind-down practice. 
okay? Here's, so here's one for you. I like afternoon and evening carbohydrates. There's a growing body of research that suggests that we have our carbohydrate intake in the evening, early evening, afternoon, early evening, it helps us sleep later. And part of this is because the, you know, the, I think the, the liver's going through some metabolic processes, dealing with some metabolites as we're sleeping, and there's a little bit of a drop in glucose in the blood, and so if we have a little bit of fuel kicking around, it can help take the edge off that. But here's where things get a bit particular. I like these carbohydrates to be lunch and supper, but then not afterwards, not after. So your evening snack, if you're gonna sit in front of the TV and have a snack, I would implore you to make that a low carbohydrate protein forward snack. Something like a dish of Greek yogurt with some berries, or I'm a big fan of cured meats and like cheese and olives, right? Charcuterie baby, it's so trendy right now. The reason why, carbs aren't bad. I'm not here to vilify carbs, believe me, I'm not about that. But when melatonin is on its way up, we've created this beautiful evening wind down, melatonin's like, yes, it's my time to shine. And then we bring in some carbohydrate. Well, in order to process the carbohydrate, insulin is another hormone that has to come in. I don't want to make, I don't bore you with this, but insulin comes in to deal with the carbohydrate. And when melatonin, I keep pointing to it, <laughs> melatonin perceives that insulin is in the room, it's like, whoa, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I thought we were going to sleep. Clearly we're not. We're still eating. I'm sorry. My bad, my bad. And melatonin kind of backs out, embarrassed. And insulin, you know, does its thing. So we, so a, a secretion of insulin at night when melatonin is trying to do, it th do its thing actually kind of delays the production or slows the production of melatonin. And you don't want that. That's your sleep hormone, baby. You want that humming. So I encourage carbohydrates in the afternoon, evening, meal, and then not for your snacks afterwards. Just try to bring in a, a low carbohydrate, high protein snack if you're going to snack. I have no judgment, by the way. If you want a snack in front of the TV, you're not in any judgment from me. I'm a zero judgment kind of gal. All, this, all of these tactics that I gave you, early daylight exposure, midday exposure, sun, sunset exposure, evening wind down, and managing carbohydrates in the evening, is all about minding your melatonin. Mind your melatonin. This is an important little hormone, my friends. Okay, so there's sleep hygiene. There's some tips that you could put into practice right now, today. You could start, you know what you could do today? Go for a sunset walk. I don't know where you live, but where I live, it got beautiful, thank God. Sunset walk is on the agenda for me. What's that gonna do? That's gonna put sunset hued light in my eyes and my light receptors. It's gonna trigger my my body to know that this day is ending. It's part of my wind down. I'm gonna be walking away from my, my freaking computers and walking and breathing and thinking and meditating and quieting my mind and just bringing the energy of the day down. That's easy. You can do that. Why don't we all do that tonight? Let's do that. You can go outside. You don't have to wear a mask, I think. I don't know, I'm not really sure. Um, that's something you can put into place right away. And I would be so curious to know if you did that, how tonight's sleep might change. But I have a lot more to talk about. Oh my gosh, I have so many things to talk about. I've barely made a dent in my list here. I wanna to touch on supplements because when we talk about melatonin, that's sort of the natural next step. Now, I just wanna give you a little caveat. I'm not a big supplement uh, person. I don't prescribe or talk about supplements a lot in my practice, but it gets asked. So I have three to recommend. Melatonin, first one. Melatonin is like the falling asleep hormone. And it's relatively safe to take. There's nothing harmful in taking it. And the reason why I'm kind of dancing around my language is because what we don't know right now is if you overdo melatonin supplementation, does it downregulate your body's ability to produce melatonin? I would actually love you to take steps to produce more melatonin. And that's all that sunlight stuff that I just talked about. That's gonna help you produce melatonin. But while you're kind of getting there and sorting this out, some melatonin supplementation can help you if getting to sleep seems to be your problem. So who has a hard time getting to sleep? Give me an emoji if, you, if falling asleep is your struggle. If falling asleep is your struggle, that's melatonin as far as I'm concerned, and that's easily fixed through all of these sleep tactics I taught and or a supplement if you need it. Let's see what Instagram is saying. How much wake up, oh, how much sun exposure for each? Let's keep it real simple and say just a 10 or 15 minute hit. Literally, coffee break in the morning, take a walk at lunch, take a little after dinner, summer, uh, after, after supper stroll. 10, 15, 20 minutes, just something 
just something to get your body into that sunlight so that your light receptors can just know, kind of know where they're at in the context of the 24 hour clock. It's just a chance for you to just like tune your circadian clock. So just sh short, don't make it a big deal. That's a good question. How long do you need, yeah, how long do you need to be? I have lupus, is, is 15 minutes of sun enough? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 15 minutes is sufficient. I think any amount, <laughs> if you're starting at zero, one minute is sufficient. Let's just start chipping away at it. But definitely if, if you have any kind of struggles with sun exposure, whether it's an autoimmune disease or if you have skin issues that you know you where you need to be careful of sun exposure, this doesn't have to be a prolonged effort. It literally is enough time in natural sunlight to just tell your circadian clock where you're at. Okay, this is a good question. Can you touch on winter light exposure when the sun sets at 4.30 and there's still a good amount of day left to power through? Oh my gosh, believe me, I know. Same, right? Hello, northern climates, northern locations. I, I'm a big fan of doing the best you can. Like, do the best you can is probably one of my unwritten rules. And so when I'm plunged into the depths of winter, if I get out and get my early daylight exposure at 10.30 in the morning, it counts. I'm like, mm, that's the soonest I could do it. If my sunset walk happens at 4 p.m., mm, it counts. It's the best I'm going to do. I end up sleeping more in the winter because I my because our exposure to daylight is so or the days are short and the nights are long. So I do end up sleeping a lot more in the winter, but I'm kind of cool with that. And I have the flexibility to do that. Um, I don't think you can do this wrong. Do the best you can given, you know, the latitude you live in. But also things like your work schedule, your family schedule, you just might not have the time to kind of stroll around 20 minutes, three times a day. I think you can find the time, but I also am very sensitive to the fact that there's busy people out there, busy peeps out there, right? Um, but I, I meet the sun where it's at. If it's the dead of winter and the sun doesn't rise until nine and it sets at four, it's like, well, that's what I got to work with. So I'm going to go with it. That we have like sun lamps. You can use sun lamps. I've literally never had a sun lamp because I do just... Um, make the time to get into the actual daylight. It doesn't have to be sunny. It can be cloudy as well, by the way. You're just in daylight. But those sun lamps are, are supposed to be quite interesting as well. But I would say, here's where I struggle with the sun lamp thing now that I'm on that down that rabbit hole. It's like if I'm up here in Canada and I'm shining a sun lamp in my eyes at 6 o'clock at night because the sun went down at 4 p.m. or 4.30, that feels upside down to me. That doesn't feel like... That feels a little unnatural to me. A little bit. I, I can't really put my finger on why, but it's like, why not just hang out with the sun when it's there? Just get a relationship with the sun. That's a good question, though. I'm so much better when I do my early morning walk as the sun comes up. That early morning walk, all of these walks, have a million benefits beyond exposure to daylight. So I love that you've found that, because I'm the same way. <laughs> Sunset walk tonight sounds lovely. Let's do it. Okay, I want to move on. So melatonin supplementation to help you fall asleep if that's your struggle. Now, who out there has a hard time staying asleep? To be honest with you, this is the one I hear most. Most of my clients say, I have no problem getting to sleep, but then I wake up. <laughs> then I'm going to talk a lot about this part because this is big. This is pretty interesting to me. But from the perspective of supplementation, magnesium is the one that's thought to help us stay asleep. And the reason for that is because magnesium is very calming. It calms your muscles, it calms your mind. So we're not having any kind of maybe painful muscle spasms that might wake us up. You might not even notice that pain is waking you up, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. But also there's a calming aspect to melatonin. So when you, if and when you do wake up, you're not maybe rattled by a very active mind. You cannot stay asleep. So magnesium is readily available. There's there's specific sleep um, versions of melatonin. You've probably heard of uh, Natural Calm is like a, a one that you can take before bed. Just take it according to the instructions on the on the canister and just do your best with it. Anytime you're going to start supplementing melatonin or magnesium, you probably want to take baby steps because it can have some irritation to the gut. So magnesium is kind of the staying asleep supplement, if that's what you're struggling with. But I have a lot more to talk about. If staying asleep is your problem, please hang on because I have a few more things I want to share. And I am trying to be really respectful of time. And by the way, massive thank you to Facebook for putting up with my technology glitches. A third supplement, the final supplement I want to talk about is CBD. Hear me out on this one because I know it's not everybody's thing. It's certainly not my thing. I'm not a, I'm not a real big cannabis user of any kind. 
Um, but I did a CBD experiment. This is this was last summer when I was wearing a, an aura ring to track my sleep quality. And I'm a pretty good sleeper anyway, but I just wanted to, I was hearing such interesting stuff about CBD oil. So I purchased the CBD oil with a tiny, tiny bit of THC, tiny bit of THC in it. And I would take this before bed, just a little spoonful or a little dropper full. And the THC in it would kind of, I would start to feel that, that kind of like little happy feeling. And that's when I would know to close my book and close my eyes. And you guys, my deep sleep quantity went way up. So if getting into deep sleep and staying asleep in the night seems to be a struggle of yours, and remember that deep sleep, we're gonna talk about this, deep sleep is the really restorative stuff that we need more of. We definitely want to be sleeping deep into the night. CBD oil um, was really interesting. It doubled my deep sleep, crazy. I, I do know that some people have weird reactions to CBD, so maybe I want to just test it a little bit. Some people have a little bit of an anxiety reaction to it, so make sure that's not a thing for you. Um, but it was a really interesting experiment that I ran. Darlene loves taking magnesium for sleep. Awesome. Okay, I want to get into this talk of like light sleepers, because this, this is a good segue, because most people who I'm reading in the comments are struggling to stay asleep. What I hear sometimes from people all the time is, oh, I'm just a light sleeper. And as soon as one of my clients says, mm, I'm just a light sleeper, it's just who I am. What I hear is, oh, well, you're not getting deep sleep. So that's a problem to solve. Tanya's saying, how much THC percentage? It was a 5% THC, 95% CBD. It was great. So if you're a light sleeper, to me, what I hear is, you're not getting into deep sleep. Why not? Light sleepers will say things like, well, I wake up every night to go to the bathroom, or I wake up because my partner rolls over, something wakes me up, and then I'm awake, because I'm a light sleeper. But flip that on its, he on its head, because if you were in deep sleep, your bladder wouldn't wake you up. Your partner rolling over wouldn't wake you up. You're hard to wake up when you're in deep sleep. Things like that don't wake you up. In fact, certain body systems actually kind of go offline in the night during deep sleep, and one of them is the bladder. It's like, mm, we're not going to bother with excreting waste right now because we're sleeping, we're busy. So if you wake up to go to the bathroom, um, that's because you weren't in deep sleep. Do, does that make sense? So it's not like I'm a light sleeper and I need to wake up and use the bathroom. It's the opposite. It's like, because I'm not sleeping deeply, I wake up and go to the bathroom. So the way we solve for this is to get into deep sleep. I get one, I got a comment here on Instagram that says husband snoring. So <laughs> husband snoring, I almost put that in here. But husband snoring is a bit different because that's a noise and, and, no, and your husband snores really loudly. That's where at least the, the original sleep hygiene rules is like get as quiet of a room as you can because noise will just disrupt you out of sleep. It, it's noise is, where you think evolutionarily, we have to be able to wake up when we hear things. Like we don't, we're not totally comatose when we're in deep sleep. We have to be able to wake up when we hear noises, right? That's part of our evolution. So hearing your husband snore is going to prevent you from getting into deep sleep. The, the only solution I can think of for this, and this is just a thought experiment. Why are we sleeping with our partners? I know it's a cultural thing. I get it. I have one. I have one of those too who snores in my bed, and uh, but like co-sleeping is shown time and again to be one of the greatest disruptors of sleep. Like what's more important? I always tell the story about my neighbors. My neighbors have separate wings. They each have their own bedroom, their own bathroom, their own little um, garden off the patio. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's it's goals. It's goals. Anyway, so your husband snoring will wake you up. And if, if sleep is important to you, it's kind of like put it on the scales of justice. Like, what's more important, sleeping with my partner or sleeping? <laughs> and maybe it's a separate bedroom situation. I'm not here. Or earplugs. Great. Earplugs. Awesome example. I don't know why I didn't think of that. So I want to talk <laughs> a sleep divorce. I do want to talk about this deep sleep, light sleep paradigm. If you truly were in deep sleep, your bladder wouldn't wake you up. Your husband rolling over wouldn't wake you up. It's, it's the, the problem is that you weren't sleeping deeply in the first place and you were able to notice your bladder, okay? So we want to get into this deep sleep cycle. Okay, so let's talk about this. You probably know that we have sleep cycles and I'm not going to get into this too, too, too heavily. Real light touch here. 
we have cycles of sleep. We have light sleep, we have deep sleep, we have REM sleep, which is another type of deep sleep. Um, we cycle throughout these throughout the night. So you're kind of in light, and you go to dark, and you go to light, and you go to REM, and you go to light, and you know, there's kind of like there's a little jog into light sleep in between deep sleep. So, and it's natural, that's perfectly fine. The light sleep and then into the deep sleep. And so when you look at a sleep uh, tracker, you'll see those ups and downs. I was in light sleep, then I went to deep, and then I went to light, and then I went to REM, and then I went to light, and then I went back to deep. And that's, that's how it goes. Don't hit the microphone. So, the REM sleep, REM sleep is this, is this cycle of sleep where we have the most brain activity. And I really think this is cool because you think about all the stuff your brain has to do during the waking hours of the day, like your brain has it hard, right? You're, of all the parts of your body, your brain is a hard ass job. And during REM sleep is when the brain is like, okay, time to rejuvenate and regenerate this thing. We got to get all these thoughts processed and filed away and we got to get memories, you know, allocated and there's a lot of work for the brain to do. And that all happens during REM sleep. Really, it's really mentally active sleep. That's why dreaming happens. Dreaming is your brain processing things that it picked up throughout the day and throughout the days, right? And as we get later and later into the night, the REM sections become a little longer. It's like the brain is really putting the pedal to the metal to get all this stuff filed away and dealt with before it's time to wake up and do it all over again. So this is very general, but generally speaking, around 3 a.m. So this is for the 3 a.m. waker uppers. Where's my 3 a.m. waker uppers? What is it about 3 a.m.? We get around 3 a.m. and it's it's not cut and dried like this, but if you find that you seem to wake up the same time every night, that's the little light sleep jog before you get into your last big deep REM sleep of the night. You're just like up in that little light sleep and then something woke you up there. Something in that moment got you. You were just gonna be there for a hot second before you got into that good REM sleep and something woke you up. What was it? I don't think it was your bladder. I don't think it was your husband rolling over. What was it? So this is the example I, this is the exercise I give to my clients. When you woke up, because well, here's what happens, you guys know this, you wake up and you lie there and like you're awake, but you're also kind of out of it. And you're like, man, I just need to go back to sleep. Like, oh, and you're like, oh man, I'm kind of hot. It's a little hot in here. You'll just lie there ruminating on how damn hot it is, but you won't get up and do anything about it, right? Because you're, you're in bed and it's like, oh my God, it's so hot. Uh, or, oh, my mouth is so dry. I just need some water or whatever it is. I ask my clients to notice the thing that woke them up. So just in your sort of half conscious state, just become really aware. What I found in doing this exercise with clients is it's typically one of two things. Number one is body temperature. Number one is body temperature. Remember what I was saying earlier that our body temperature drops, drops, drops in the middle, like the deep, deep part of our sleep, we're at our coolest body temperature. And then it starts to slowly climb again as we start to wake up. If we're too warm in that in that deep part of the sleep, it's we're gonna wake up. It's it's a discord that we we can't manage. So body temperature usually being too hot is the thing that woke you up. And then once you're awake, then your mind goes crazy. We'll talk about that in a second too. Mind goes crazy. What to do about that? I'm gonna give you some tactics for that too. But the body temperature woke you up. That's just good to know. So of course, if you were to wake up and open a window, wake up and a you know, take the duvet off, kick a leg out. If you do, if you do that, you, it would solve the problem. You get back to sleep. But the temperature thing was what woke you up. So if you can solve for that next time before you get into bed, if you can get into bed and make it even cooler in your room before you fall asleep, then feasibly when you get into that little blip of light sleep, it won't wake you up because you'll be at the appropriate temperature. Body temperature more than anything is the thing that seems to wake people up at 3 a.m during that phase of light sleep, right before your big crush sesh of REM sleep before you wake up in the morning. So can you solve for that before you go to bed? The second thing that wakes people up is discomfort, physical discomfort. This takes a little bit more paying attention. It's like, yeah, I woke up, like my neck was kind of sore or you know, my, my hips feel sore or what, I have a sore knee, it was throbbing. I had a sore knee, I had a sore knee. And I was waking up at three in the morning during that blip of light sleep, something was waking me up and it was like, what is waking me up? I do everything right, come on. And I, I managed to grab enough consciousness one day. And that's the hard part is grabbing enough consciousness in that moment at three in the morning to really pay attention and be like, 
oh my god my right knee is throbbing my right knee is throbbing I didn't I my knee is sore something about being in that very paralyzed sort of state in your bed you become highly aware of little niggling aches and pains that maybe you were able to not pay attention to during the day so I started paying attention to this sore right knee joint pain yes and this takes some work but I was like why is my knee sore and this was during lockdown I wasn't even exercising let's be real it was tied to diet. I was having a little bit more like corn, sugar, inflammatory foods that I know don't work for me. I just know that about myself. So I cha made a little dietary change. It made my joints feel better. And then guess what happened? I wasn't waking up at three in the morning. It was my knee waking me up. Once I knew that, I could troubleshoot the knee. So troubleshoot the root cause. This is root cause medicine, baby. Not medicine, but root cause, right? If your body temperature is waking you up, it's not because you're a light sleeper. You were in light sleep, but something woke you up. Was it your temperature? Was it body pain? Was it something else? Was it your husband snoring? Is there a really irritating street light out there that happened to you? Know, what is it? Do you, need, do you need to change something in your physical environment? Do you need to change something in your diet? What is it? I, you have to start chipping away at it. Otherwise, you're just going to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning every day. Okay, now... When you do wake up, it, let me know if this lands with you because I hear this a lot. I wake up to use the bathroom or whatever because you didn't get into deep sleep, so you're awake. And then your active mind, then my mind goes crazy. I start thinking, start ruminating, and then I can't get back to sleep. Is that familiar to anybody? Shelby says, I usually get woken up by having to use the bathroom. So my theory on that is that didn't wake you up. You were already only in, you weren't in deep sleep. If you were in deep sleep, your bladder probably wouldn't wake you up. But I will talk about this a little bit later when I get into the perimenopause thing. In a perfect scenario, your bladder wouldn't wake you up. If your bladder wakes you up, it's because you didn't achieve deep sleep. Does that make sense? It's like a chicken egg thing. It's not like I wake up because my bladder woke me. It's like I wasn't in deep enough sleep, so my bladder was able to disrupt my sleep kind of thing. Okay, let's get back to the mental activity. So think about this, three in the morning, you wake up, you're about to cruise into a big REM sleep session where your brain is going to do all the work. Your brain is active. Your mind is highly active in the wee hours of the morning. It's got shit to catalog, right? So yes, your brain is active. It's important too. all the stuff that your brain is thinking about and all that random stuff that comes into your head is actually important. And if you were asleep, you wouldn't notice it, but you're awake. So what do we do with this? This is something that I looked into and the, and the best tactic I came up with um, is to just, well, basically just to let your brain do it. Okay, so here's the deal. When you're, when you're lying in bed at three in the morning, your brain's going crazy and you're like, God, oh, I just need to go back to sleep. Oh, why can't I turn my brain off? This is so annoying. Oh my God. Oh my God. My alarm's going to be going off in three hours. I need to get back to sleep. Like you're just freaking out about it. You're stressing about it. You're adding fuel to the fire. So this goes back to like addressing the pressing needs. Remember I said earlier, like if you wake up and you feel too hot, make yourself cool. If you wake up and your mouth is dry, get a drink of water. If you wake up and your bladder is full, go to the bathroom. Address the pressing need. Don't just lie there and stress about it. So this especially is important for your brain stuff. This is a really interesting tactic that I heard and I gave it to one of my clients to try and she said it worked like crazy. So she woke up three in the morning, whatever it was, and then her active mind prevented her from getting back to sleep. And the tactic is this, get up out of your bed, fumble around in the dark, try not to stub your toe. We don't wanna turn any lights on, okay? Do not look at your phone. Do not kill time by looking at your phone. You know why, right? I'll just tell you that, right? You know why. So you're in the dark, you're fumbling around, go into the living room, sit on the couch in the dark and let the thinking just go. Just let the brain do its thinking. The brain's like, it's gonna do it anyway. The brain is in a thinking mode during deep sleep. It's gonna do all that work. You're not gonna be able to turn it off. So just ride that wave. Just go out there in the living room and let the brain think. And what ends up happening is the brain tires itself out. And by you not lying in bed stressing about not being asleep, you're just able to let the brain kind of continue its little thing and it doesn't take long. This client said that within 10 minutes, she was, she was, her eyelids were drooping. She was ready to go back to bed and go right back to sleep. So you've probably heard this before, this whole idea about your environment. Like if you're, if you're lying in bed, stressing about not sleeping, you've just ascribed a stressful environment to your sleep sanctuary. And that's going to be hard to break. We want to, we don't want to have connections like that. 
So get your ass out of bed. Go sit in the living room. Don't turn on any lights because if you turn on lights, you're going to disrupt your circadian rhythm. Try to do it in the dark. By the way, if you go to the bathroom, try to do that in the dark too. Sit in the living room. Let your brain do its thing. Don't try to overthink. Don't try to stop thinking. Just let it think. Just sit there quietly staring into the darkness. Your brain will keep doing what it's doing and then you will find yourself getting tired and then you just carry yourself back to bed. You might be awake for 15, 20, 30 minutes. This client said in 10 minutes it got it done for her consistently. It was like one of the most game-changing tricks she tried. Um, but here's one more thing I just want to add to this. You want to pay attention to how it's affecting you because here's the deal gang if you wake up at three in the morning and you can't get back to sleep and then you do fall back to sleep eventually because that always happens it seems like you're awake for hours but you do fall back to sleep and then your alarm goes off and you wake up are you tired or are you fine it sounds like a crazy question but like hear me out because some people are naturally what's called biphasic sleepers some people just naturally sleep in two chunks and they wake up for a period of time in the middle and then they go back to sleep and they're fine. So if you wake up after in the morning and you're like, well, I feel fine. I feel great. I feel well, well rested. You might just be a biphasic sleeper. That just might be who you are. And then for you waking up in the middle of the night is just part of your sort of archetype. But if you are wait, if you're dragging ass the next morning, then you're not a biphasic sleeper and you were just woken up by something. And the solution for that is allow yourself to get into deep sleep by all using all these sleep hygiene tactics and all this stuff I've taught you create the best possible scenario to get into deep sleep and to stay in deep sleep. And then if by some chance something wakes you up, pay attention to what it was that woke you up and, and solve for it. And if your mind starts going active, let it go. Just go somewhere else, let the mind do its thing, then come back to bed when you feel tired. I think these are really great tips. Meditation. That's a great one. I was, I had that on my list actually. Um, there's a breathing exercise called box breathing. Have you guys heard of box breathing? And it's thought to tone the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that kind of controls the parasympathetic nervous system, which is like the rest and digest part of the nervous system. And so when, you know, when you're asleep, you're resting, you're digesting, you're repairing, you're processing, it's very parasympathetic experience. And so this box breathing technique, um, if you wake up in the night and you're really struggling to get back to sleep, trying some box breathing, some people really swear by it. So box breath, if you don't know what it is, it's an inhale through the nose, inhale through the nose for a count of four, hold at the top at the top of the inhale for a count of four then exhale for a count of four now some people say to exhale through your mouth I don't know if it matters and then hold at the bottom at the exhale for a count of four so it's a square inhale hold exhale hold so um, and meditation is interesting I have a client right now who does sleep stories for through the calm app and she said, when I wake up in the middle of the night, maybe I'll just do another sleep story on my Calm app. And I'm like, I'm totally liking that, except that you have to open your phone. <laughs> and then you're on your phone and that's a blue light into your eyeballs at three in the morning. Your brain will not know what to do with that. So if you can meditate without having to use your device, cool. That's why box breathing is kind of cool because it's pretty analog, right? Oh, box breathing on the Peloton app. They thought of everything. It's crazy Peloton. So that's a lot. So I gave you a lot. I gave you things to do to set up your sleep. I gave you things to do to troubleshoot while you're having struggles with sleep. I think you need to be very intentional about this. We can't just fuss and be grumpy about our poor quality of sleep. We need to take the bull by the horns and say like, why am I waking up? What can I do about it? Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, oh Teresa. Okay. Teresa said, Teresa tried the thing last week where she went and left the bedroom, sat out on the couch or whatever. After 10 minutes, she was back to bed and out cold for the next two hours. Mm. Yes, I love hearing that. Let's try that. Okay, if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and your brain goes crazy, what are you going to do? You're going to get your ass out of bed. You're not going to turn on any lights. You're going to go sit in the living room. Let your brain do its thing. And then you'll go back to bed when it's done. It works. Okay. If, you, if you'll indulge me, I just want to touch on the perimenopause thing. So I found two things that seem consistent for what wakes us up suddenly, even good sleepers like me, even champion sleepers who wear the melatonin molecule around their neck, struggling with sleep. Like I don't, I'm waking up at three in the morning. I don't like that. I don't have a sore knee anymore. And my body temperature is going, what's going on. So here's the two prevailing theories for when we get into perimenopause. Why does sleep start to suck 
when we're getting into that change of life, perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, the whole kit and caboodle. It's a freaking decade of life, I guess. Something to look forward to. So first one is temperature. Not to be a broken record, but as we know, there's a change in our vasomotor control, um, which is what causes hot flashes. So hot flashes, that's a pretty common symptom for people going through menopause and, and whatnot. And that vasomotor, this is like the um, expanding and constricting of blood vessels. It's kind of out of whack. It's kind of kooky. It gets kind of kooky during menopause. And that can cause us to have night sweats and just hot flashes at night as well. So we have these warm, these sort of periods of warmth, again, when we're expecting to be cool. The body is expecting us to be cool and then whatever, our perimenopausal body cues up a big old hot flash and now we're warm. So temperature is the big one. I got to tell you guys about a gadget that I, you know, I love. Okay, so this isn't bothering me. So I am not waking up from temperature. My temperature is on point. So I use a, a, a gadget called the Chili Pad. I'm going to put the, I'll put a link in the Facebook thing here. You guys know the Chili Pad. I talk about it all the time. Um, a chili Pad. Okay, so look it up. ChiliSleep.com. This is a cooling pad you put underneath your fitted sheet and it runs cool water through channels and you can adjust the temperature. When I first got my chili pad, I think this was maybe two and a half years ago, I set my temperature to like 63 degrees Fahrenheit. That was my sleeping temperature. As I've cruised into perimenopause, that has gone down considerably. I'm at now 57. It has to be at 57, which is pretty cold. That's pretty cold when I go to bed. It's pretty cold in the morning when I wake up, but where it's perfect is in the middle of the night and I had to I had to play with that a little bit so I had to adjust it down one degree at a time one degree at a time I found that when I got to 57 degrees at least right now that's where it's at if I set my chili pad to 57 degrees that seems to keep me ideally cool in during the deep sleep part of the night which is what I really wanted I really want that deep sleep you want that deep deep so it's interesting like I my body temperature theoretically then has climbed six degrees in the last couple of years because I had it at 63. Now it's at 57. There was a six degree change in my body temperature. I'm correlating that to the joys of perimenopause. This thing though is so amazing. I do have a discount code, by the way. You go to chillysleep.com and use the code chillypad20. Chillypad20. I, I can try to type that in here. Hmm. Chillypad20. Just remember, write it down. Chili pad 20, all one word. You get 20% off a chili pad. That's the one I have. And the chili pad, you just set one temperature and then it stays that temperature all night. They have an upgraded one called the Uller, which can program um, sort of a schedule. So you'd have it warmer. As you go to sleep, it would go to a cooler temperature in the middle of the night and then it would warm back up as you want to wake up. I'm totally upgrading to the Uller because that's so interesting to me to like have that beautiful wave. Uh, that one's way more expensive and I have a discount code for that one. That's Uller15, O-O-L-E-R-1-5, all one word, 15% off an Uller. These things are expensive. <laughs> They're not cheap. They're not cheap. They're expensive as heck. Did I lose the Facebook feed again? Are we good? No, we're still good. Okay. They're expensive. Okay. So I, I didn't have a discount code when I bought my chili pad. I paid full price for it. I think it was 600 US dollars for the half king size one. That's crazy when you, especially when you convert it to Canadian dollars and then factor in the shipping, it was nuts. And it was the best investment I made in my health that I can think of because I can sleep deeply. I'm not being woken by perimenopausal hot flashes in the middle of the night. It's, I mean, come on, like it, the Uller, which I plan to upgrade to is super expensive, but I'm doing it because I know that you can't trifle with sleep. So anyway, I don't want to push expensive gadgets on you. That's not what I'm about. But if temperature is your struggle, you guys, this is life saving, life saving. Oh my gosh, you've been researching it. It's amazing. I have discount codes, so please make sure you use them. You can DM me if you didn't catch them. I'll DM, I'll, um, I'll DM it to you. Okay. Um, now the second, the second factor that seems to afflict perimenopausal women, and this is going to kind of circle back to what we were talking about earlier, when estrogen and progesterone start to do their kind of wacky thing during perimenopause, one of the side effects, and I, I don't fully mechanistically understand this yet, I, I need to dive into it some more, but one of the commonly cited side effects of this is bladder sensitivity. So it's not that your bladder is suddenly more full, but it's just that it's it's more sensitive. 
So you do get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. It's not, it feels kind of urgent, but it's actually not. Like you don't, you're not producing a lot of urine. Bladder sensitivity seems to tick up a little during perimenopause. Now, I am interested in this because that's what's been waking me up. Okay. My temperature is good. I got the chili pad. It's rocking and rolling. But my bladder has been waking me up and I'm so grouchy about that. Because I just finished telling you guys, if you're in deep sleep, your bladder shouldn't wake you up. But like a highly sensitive bladder that's like, yo, this is an emergency. That maybe could wake you up if you weren't fully in deep sleep. But still, I'm hedging my bets. I'm like, you know what? I need to get into deeper sleep because I don't want my bladder waking me up. I don't, I will not stand for that. I don't, I'm not going to wet the bed. There's not a lot of, you know, I'm not going to. It's just a more sensitive bladder. What I need to do is to get into deeper sleep. So I'm doubling down on my daylight exposure. I'm doubling down on my melatonin production. And I've come back to CBD. I've come back to CBD oil because when I did that experiment, I achieved amazing, unrattleable deep sleep by using CBD oil. And guess what, you guys? Freaking worked. Freaking worked. I have not been woken up by my bladder in five days. I've slept through the night for the last five days. I can't say that I had been doing that before um, since this kind of weird bladder thing showed up for me. So that just goes to show that getting into deep sleep is the ticket. And now all the things I've taught you here will help you to get in deep sleep. You don't have to jump right to CBD oil. For me, it was like, I want to nip this in the bud. There's that phrase again, nip it in the bud. It's not butt, it's bud. Um, the sunlight, the daylight exposure, the evening wind down, the man managing carbohydrates in the afternoon and evening, um, all of these melatonin supporting behaviors, and then the little additional CBD has made it so that my slightly more sensitive bladder is not waking me up because I'm really, really dropping into deep sleep. <sighs> Those are my solutions for you. So, questions. That's a lot. That was an hour of lots of stuff, and I barely scraped the surface. I even had more things I wanted to talk about, but I'm trying to be respectful of time. Um, we got a question, probiotics and sleep. Um, I'm not a big probiotic pusher. I mean, your gut microbiome is important for your mental health, and you know, your ser most of your serotonin, which is the wakefulness hormone, is made in the gut. Something like 90% of your serotonin is made by your gut bacteria. So that's really important for your wakefulness hormone and serotonin is the is the counter hormone to melatonin so probably there's some kind of relationship there like if serotonin's humming then feasibly melatonin would also be humming and that relationship probably works so i think good gut health generally good gut health what a what a vague blanket term but supporting your gut through gut supporting nutrition and behaviors is probably really important i i don't have a lot to say about probiotics because i don't i don't do supplementation really my practice at all. I touched on three supplements here today just because I thought people might have questions about them, but I think you can support your gut microbiome through really great nutrition choices. And then yes, that would have some impact on your brain chemistry, which ultimately is where all these hormones are coming from, right? I wanted to let you know before I pop off, pop off, that I'm giving away a chili pad. I'm giving away a chili pad inside the Metabolic Reboot. So I'm, I, my Metabolic Reboot program, I run it twice a year. Uh, May and November is when I'm running it these days. The May Reboot actually starts this Thursday. It's not even May yet. I'm starting early. And I'm giving away a chili pad as one of the grand prizes. So if you want to join that, I'm going to put the website in just if you're interested. How do you win it? That's a good question. I'll tell you how you win it. You win it by... It's hard to type. www. I, I give you points for being highly engaged. So when I created the Metabolic Reboot, I was like, I don't want people chucking this on their credit card and then ignoring it. I want them actually doing the work. So if you're highly engaged in the Facebook group, in the live workshops that I host, this is so hard to type over here. Oh my gosh. Um, you get points and the highest points earners win prizes. I'm giving away chili pad. I'm giving away cash. I'm giving away coaching. I'm giving away a lot of stuff, but the chili pad is an expensive gadget. You guys, and I know that it's like, Oh, I know it's hard to invest in gadgets and I don't like to push gadgets or supplements or anything expensive, but man, oh, I love my chili pad so much. I love it so much. Like the last time I traveled, I went to Miami. That was my last trip I ever went on. That was, um, million years ago, half a million, I can't remember. It's a long time ago. I was like, 
It's gonna be really hot in Miami. Should I bring my chili pad with me? It's not like it doesn't, it's not a light packing kind of device, right? But I love it, it's crazy. So I'm giving one away. If that's something that's interesting to you, check out the reboot. I put the link here in Instagram, put the link here in Facebook. If you're on Instagram, the link is in my bio. There's a whole big website about the metabolic reboot. You can read about it, see if it's something that's interesting to you. And DM me on Instagram for, DM me on Instagram for those discount codes. Um, and uh, I want you guys to have good sleep. It's, oh, you gotta have good sleep. And I, I feel for anybody who's not having good quality sleep and it's about getting into that deep sleep. That's really where the magic happens, the deep, deep sleep. So all the stuff I talked about here, to mind your melatonin, to adjust your environment, to get into deep sleep, to be mindful of what's waking you up and then solve for that. Be mindful and then solve for it. Like take the bull by the dang horns, you guys. Got some questions. Do you have an idea of a good duration of sleep? What would a good duration of sleep be? This is a question on Facebook. That's a really good question. And I think it uh, is a loaded question because that from what I've researched, it can be anywhere from like seven to nine hours typically, but then there's people on the outlier edges who need six or who need 10. Um, I think it's worth running an experiment to see where you land. But if you're going to run an experiment to see, okay, my perfect sweet spot in terms of number of hours of sleep is eight and a half, you have to control for sleep quality because it doesn't actually matter how many hours you're lying in bed with your eyes closed. If it's not good quality sleep, if you're not getting through all the sleep cycles, you got to solve for sleep quality before you can even contemplate quantity. Just another one of those scenarios where quality trumps quantity. So try these things to get your quality dialed in. And what I think what you'll find is that your body will tell you how much sleep it needs. The body is really smart. Pause due to poor connection. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Am I back? Okay, good question. Is it better over a longer period or multiple periods throughout the night? I don't know. I don't know the I don't know how to answer that question. Give me some more information. Maybe that was related to something that I um I said earlier. What about you guys? Invest in sleep slash sanity. I agree. Yeah. Totally good point. Uller15. Yes, that's the code for Uller. Uller. Oh my gosh, you guys gotta buy these chili pads. Apparently I have been lost again. Apparently my connection went away. So I'm going to just take a cue from the technology gods <laughs> and wrap this up. I think my connection on Instagram managed to stay the whole time. So I'm going to pull this video down off Instagram. I'm going to put it up on YouTube. I'm going to share it with the Facebook group because you guys had it bad. I This whole thing was supposed to be in the Facebook group and Facebook crashed on me 10 times. So I'm going to share the replay with anybody who wants it. Um, don't forget to go for a sunset walk. Let's all go for a sunset walk tonight. Let's try to get our bedrooms nice and cool. And if you do wake up tonight, I want you to find out why. And you can DM, send me a message tomorrow. Let me know what woke you up. I want you to start paying attention to that, okay? Let's do this. Let's get some good quality sleep. We need it. Our brains need it. Our bodies need it. You need it. You deserve it. Let's make it happen. All right. Thank you so much for hanging with me, putting up my technology struggles. And uh, have a great night's sleep, guys. All right. We'll see you again soon, I hope. Peace out, Instagram.